So, as you already said, my name is Franziska. I work as a data scientist at the Scientific IT Services at ETA. And today I'm going to talk to you about how to boost research with machine learning. So, why is it a good idea at all to apply machine learning and research? So we know that machine learning is quite powerful um, in the detection of hidden patterns. Like for example, the record. Oh, okay. That's getting a little bit louder now. <laughs> uh, okay, so like for example, the um, recognition of objects and images or the detection of events in time series. And um, apparently a lot of research projects and a lot of research data sets deal with the, yeah, quite similar um, problems. And um, what is also quite important is that um, standard statistical methods fail for some of these problems. And that's why researchers came to the idea to apply machine learning as a tool to actually tackle these problems. And at first I would like to show you some recent applications of machine learning and research. So the first one um, is coming from CERN, which is the High Energy Physics Laboratory uh, located in Switzerland. And they're producing a lot of um, data during collision experiments. And what they basically want to do based on this data is to um, discover and characterize new particles. And since they have this huge amount of data, they need other approaches than standard methods to actually do this detection of these particles. So what they, for example, here did is they released a data set, a part of their data, um, for a challenge, for a machine learning challenge, and just made it available for machine learning researchers so that they can try to find a good solution for their problem. Another example is coming more from the medical field. Um, in that case, it's um, more about the prediction of epileptic seizures. So imagine a patient suffering from these epileptic seizures. Um, and the goal here is um, that there are devices implanted in their head so um, that these devices can predict these upcoming seizures, then also can counteract um, this seizure so that patients are not suffering anymore that much. And then the last example um, I'm showing is also coming from the medical field. Um, but in that case, we're dealing with image data. And what the goal here is to do recognition of um, this tissue, um, a recognition between healthy tissue and cancer regions within that image. And the idea is that usually medical doctors have to do that task and um, that algorithms can take over this, um, yeah, this work and um, can assist the medical doctors in this prediction or classification of these different tissues. So, and as we already can see from these few examples I've shown you so far, um, we see that we can, or we have two different fields of application of machine learning and research. Um, the first one is to uncover hidden patterns in the data. Like, from, for example, you have a huge data set for these collision experiments, and you want to get more insight into the data. And what also helps a lot here is, for example, if you're using classic machine learning, that we have interpretable models, and then yeah, get also more information about um, the data set itself. And then the second application is um, to do an automation of time-consuming events. For example, this classification of the tissue, either we have cancer regions or not, um, so that an algorithm can take over this task and not a medical doctor has to do this in the end. So after um, I've shown you like a, um, a few examples um, of um, yeah, current applications in machine learning, the next thing I want to do is, at first, I would like to show you the basic building blocks of machine learning pipelines, not only in research, um, also in general for machine learning projects. And then I will show you two specific use cases, so two specific applications of machine learning and research. Um, the first one is about um, the detection of arm movements based on EEG signals. And the second one is um, for the segmentation, so the um, yeah, localization of specific um, cells within an image. Um, all the use cases I will show you here is based on public available data sets. So it's nothing which has to do with my work I'm doing at ETH. It's um, something I um, yeah, did as a, yeah, as a project in order to explore these public available data sets. Okay, so now coming to um, yeah, these different building blocks of machine learning pipelines. Um, usually it starts with a data set which was recorded during an experiment. And then based on the data we recorded, we want to make some kind of prediction. So for example, coming back to the example from the epilepsy patients, we have this time series, and then we want to say whether there's an upcoming epileptic event or not. 
Um, <clears throat> and then there should be something in between, which should bring us from um, yeah, the, the data itself to the prediction. So what I just called here black box, but of course this black box can be filled with more content. And um, what is happening in between is first of all the pre-processing of the data, which is quite important and always depending on the data you have. Um, and then the second step is always the modeling, so that you train a model and algorithm which is then actually taking over the task. And luckily, Python provides a lot of different toolboxes which can be applied. And I just name here a few, um, but um, those ones which are mostly used are, for example, SciPy for the processing of data, especially, for example, for time series, um, but also Pandas, which is quite helpful for the handling of tabular data. And then for the modeling itself, um, scikit-learn is really important for classic machine learning models. And then Keras um, is for the implementation of deep neural networks. So now we know these different building blocks we need to yeah, get from our data to our prediction, but how does that actually look like when we want to implement that in Python? And the implementation looks as follows. Um, at first, of course, we have to um, import the specific libraries we need, um, and also, for example, helper functions like specific pre-processing we want to apply to our data. And then, of course, um, we have to load our data um, here we do a split between the data itself and the observed outcome, so something what the model should predict in the end. Then, at the second step, um, the pre-processing is done to the data, which means, um, so anything you want to do, let's imagine you have different subjects in a medical experiment and you want to have a standardization between different sub subjects, um, you apply some kind of normalization, um, <clears throat> or it could be anything else depending on your data. And then what is always quite important that you do the split of your data in the training and validation set because you don't not only want to train your, data, um, your algorithm, you also want to validate that's actually a good model you got in the end so that it's bringing you or giving you a good result. Then the modeling part itself is then done as follows. So you choose a specific model, like for example in this case the logistic regression. You could also add specific parameters to this logistic regression and then basically just do a fit of um, the chosen model with your training data set. And then the last step, you generate a prediction based on your validation set and then also choose some kind of score to um, yeah, evaluate um, how good your model is. So for example, in this case, the accuracy. So these are the different building blocks we need um, to come from the data to the prediction. And now I would like to show you two specific use cases. The first one is to predict arm movements based on EEG signals. So why is it important? Imagine there are persons who lost, for example, one arm, um, and they want to use these artificial arms and control the movement of these artificial arms. So what is important then is to get the brain activity, which is connected to these arm movements, and based on the brain activity, predict on cr and control um, the arm, so the movement of the arm. So how do, you, how do these um, experiments look like? Um, <clears throat> so these experiments are done with healthy patients, of course, because you need both the brain activity and the movement of the arm. And um, at first, um, these patients get a e, what is called an EEG cap. So it's a cap with 32 different electrodes, which are then connected to the brain, so um, just attached to the brain, and can measure the activity, the brain activity. And then, um, what they're doing at the same time, while their brain activity is measured, um, that they're doing these arm movements. So for example, they're grabbing something, they're lifting something, and releasing something again. And then in this case, um, so I will show you a little bit of the data, but since um, we have a lot of time series, we need a, to do a lot of pre-processing to get more information out of our data before we can actually do the modeling itself. So that's why I will, yeah walked you through this quite um, yeah, um, heavy uh, pre-processing um, steps, step by step. Um, <clears throat> so at first, um, again, there's a figure of, um, or a scheme of the distribution of electrodes across the scalp. So this is actually a, a view on top of the head. And um, this little triangle is the nose, and we see how these different electrodes are distributed all over the head. And um, I will show you time recordings for a few of these channels, but not all of them, because just 
there's just too much data to show at the same time, but um, I will show you the recordings of these four different channels which are um, highlighted here in this plot. And <clears throat> these time recordings look as follows. So we have um, these recordings um, of these four different channels as a function of time. And what is also um, in the data set is um, the different arm movements. So we see here a recording over eight seconds. We see these recordings um, of the eight channels and we see the different arm movements have, which have been done. In this case, it's six different arm movements. It's not important which arm movement it is exactly. It's just important that there was an arm movement happening, like lifting, releasing, grabbing, and so on. And as we already can see here is that it's quite hard to tell just from the time series itself to tell whether there was like an arm movement at all going on or which arm movement, for example, to make a distinc distinction between different arm movements. So for that reason, several yeah, processing steps have to be done. And at first, um, what is done is to, to split the data into different time windows, time frames. Um, the reason for that is, so usually when we are talking about this activity or about this arm movements, that's not only happening at one specific time, there's also something before and also something afterwards. So for that reason, we're looking at these windows of, for example, one second. In this case, 500 data points are always one second. And all the further modifications are done to this specific frame. Um, since we're using a sliding window, um, we will, um, yeah, um, split the data um, to all the different frames. And so in the end, we have the length of the, of the time series times 500, which is giving us the amount of windows um, we are looking at and doing the modifications to. <clears throat> yes, so and one single um, window is looking as follows. So it's just uh, one second out of this time series and we apply this um, sliding window to the whole time series. So then the first modification which is done is um, to apply a low pass filter. Why is that important? Um, so the brain is um, operating at specific brain rhythms and we know that um, above a specific threshold um, it can rather be yeah, seen as noise what the brain is producing and not really as something which is giving you information about the brain activity. So for that reason we get rid of all the high frequency parts of the, of the signal and just stick to the lower frequency parts. Um, and then the next uh, modification, the power of the signal is generated, which is just giving you some insight or information about the energy of the signal and is computed by squaring um, just yeah, every data point. And then in the last step, we just take the temporal average of all of these one second windows um, so that in the end, we just, for all of these windows we generated in the beginning, we get just one value per channel. And then we use this data to do the model training and fitting in the end. So, and I've shown you this quite complex pre-processing of the data, and I will follow or uh, continue with um, the modeling itself. So how can um, a classic machine learning model um, can look like to actually predict the arm movement based on the data we produce in the pre-processing? Here it is. So um, what I use in this case um, is called um, a voting classifier, which is um, provided by scikit-learn. Um, and the nice thing here is that we combine several weak classifiers in order to get a stronger one. So namely in this case, um, I use three different classifiers, a linear discriminant analysis, um, a random forest classifier, and a logistic regression. All these classifiers are combined. And then in the end, um, this combined classifier, this voting classifier, is fitted, trained to the training data, and then there's a prediction made based on the training data set or test set. No, validation set, I'm sorry. Um, not mixing up training and validation set. Okay, and so once we've done this um, training of the model and then also the prediction, we of course want to know how the prediction looks like. If this classic and quite simple model is um, giving us a good result, and um, the results um, yeah, produced by this model looks as follows. So at first we look at the observed event. So that's actually what um, in experiments have been observed, um, which is just the time points of um, the observed arm movements as a function of time. Um, and wherever there's um, a blue line, an arm movement actually happened, and wherever there's white space, there was no arm movement. And now I will add the um, predicted event, so what the model predicted to be an arm movement. And that looks as follows. So wherever there's 
a dashed line on top of a blue line, we see that the model predicted correctly that um, there was an R movement. Whenever there is only a dashed line, the model predicted not correctly and said that there's an R movement, although there was no R movement. And wherever there's just a straight line, um, the model missed an event. So of course, this is just, um, yeah, just a short time period within a longer um, um, validation set. But um, to get more impression on how good the model actually is in the end, and we can also look, for example, at the confusion matrix. Um, and so the information you can get out of this confusion matrix is first that um, we have around 70% of events which were predicted correctly. Because when we're looking here at um, the confusion matrix, we see that there are around 9,000 events which were predicted in the right way, and we have around 12,000 events in total. So uh, almost 13,000. So we have around 17% of events which were predicted correctly. And what we can also get out of this confusion matrix is that we have hardly any false alarm because um, we have only 113 events where the model predicted that there was an arm movement, but there was actually none. So as I've shown you for this first use case, we could see that um, this classic machine learning model provides, um, um, I would say, reasonable good prediction for um, this quite complex task of predicting arm movements just on these time series. Um, and what I didn't sh show you here in detail, but in general, these classic machine learning models also can give you deeper insight into the data. So for example, here you could, um, just based on the trained model, um, could give a prediction on which channel is quite important for the prediction of the arm movements and which channels are not. Um, and then also what is quite important is that this model is running or it's just having a computation low cost. So the whole training for this model um, was running on a single CPU and just took around 30 minutes, which is quite fast and just gives us a good result compared to other methods. So that was the first use case um, where applied classic machine learning um, and also was more looking at um, how we can get a like, deeper insight into the data by applying these models. And now in the second use case, I want to um, focus on the automatic generation of segmentation images. So for those of you who don't know what segmentation images are, I will um, explain in a second. But um, first of all, I will show you the, the raw data, which looks as follows. Um, so we see these images, um, which are just yeah, visualizations of brain slices. So we see all these different cell types and structures we can observe in the brain. And what researchers now want to know is, um, for example, one specific structure. So for example, what we can see here in white is just a specific part of the cell. And they want to have that highlighted throughout the whole, for example, stack of images. And since um, we are not talking about, like, for example, all these different structures within the image, just about one specific, um, it's quite hard to do that by, for example, computer vision algorithms because we just want to focus on this specific part of the cell. And for that reason, in many cases, um, this segmentation image is, for example, done by hand. So it's quite time consuming to generate these images. And for that reason, the, the question is if there's also a way to do an automatic detection, for example, of these shapes within that image. And before I will show you the, the kind of not network which can actually take over this kind of task, um, I will show you some, some slides on the general um, implementation of neural networks in Keras so that you can get an impression of how simple neural networks are implemented in Keras. So what we see here on that picture is um, just a quite simple feed-forward neural network with um, an input layer, um, two hidden layers, and um, an output layer and also all the connections between those different layers since we have all-to-all -all connections um, between the layers. And basically what is done during training is that we feed in an input into the model, it's processed during the whole network, and then in the end a specific output is generated, like for example a classification or a regression based on the problem and data you are using. And the nice thing is that Keras allows to implement that quite easily, um, all these different layers in Python. So basically what you have to do to um, get this kind of, or apply this kind of network is first you import these different layers you want to use, saying for example the input layer or dense layer, which is a layer which is giving you all these all-to-all -all connections. 
um, then you specify the out input. Um, important thing here is that you also name the amount of neurons you want to use. Then you have two hidden layers um, where you also specify the amount of neurons and then the output in the end. Then you put all these different layers um, which you are ordered or have ordered in a sequential way um, in one model um, and then uh, um, yeah, specify also the input and output which is used. And as I said before, um, or maybe I haven't mentioned, but um, so the, the network which can be used to um, generate these segmentation images is quite complex. So I will show you the general structure, but I don't want to go into detail because it's just too much to show now within that shorter time. But um, I want to give you the general intuition about the, the, what the network is doing. So the network looks as follows. And what we want to focus on here is um, that we have these two different branches. So we have this downstream branch and we have an upstream branch and we have these skip connections between these different branches. And um, so if you want to have more information about this type of model, I also added the citation. So there are these guys which are actually developed the model so you can also read up on this if you want. Um, so what is now important here for these different branches is that um, this downstream branch basically extracts the what information. So what is the shape of the cell we actually want to detect within an image? And then the upstream branch um, more extracts the, um, the where information. So where is that specific type of the cell or the specific region of a cell we want to extract? And then there are also these skip connections that actually give this information from the downstream to the upstream branch. And now let's imagine you defined this kind of model in a um, different file, for example, and you want to load it um, into your Python code um, and also then train it. Um, that would look as follows. So you would yeah, import your model, um, your unit, load this unit, and then basically just do a fit of the model with your training data and then also a prediction um, based on your test data. So basically that's quite similar also to all these, yeah, to the training um, of models um, what we've seen before for scikit-learn. So it's basically just the same, yeah, the same steps you have to do. Okay, so now we trained our unit. Now we actually want to see what kind of prediction it gives us. So what is the output in the end? <clears throat> So at first, I again show you the raw image. So that is what is um, yeah, just a normal image from our test data, test data set we put into um, our model and then generate the prediction. And, and next, I show you the ground truth. So actually, how should it look like? What would it be um, if a person would um, color all these different regions of the cell? And then at next, I show you the prediction, which is, um, I would say, quite a good result for um, an algorithm which is detecting these different shapes and objects within an image. Um, so of course this is just one single example, but um, I can say you that um, the whole training or the, the, the whole network in the end reached an accuracy of 99% um, or 98%, um, close to 99%. So it's giving you a quite a good result for, for um, this kind of task um, compared to um, that it's quite time consuming for a person doing it again and again. Okay, so that already brings me to my second summary for the second part. So what I've shown you for the second use case is that these deep learning models provide um, or assist in the automatization of time-consuming events or time-consuming processes, like for example, the generation of these segmentation images. And what is also quite helpful with deep learning is um, that it can recognize patterns in complex data sets. For, for example, this shape of the different cells or part of the cells and um, yeah, how that then can be put into the prediction. Um, what deep learning does not offer is that um, it's not giving you interpretability of the model. So that means, of course, we can train the model and we can look at the model weights in the end, but it's quite hard to tell which weight belongs to which prediction or, for example, to which feature and um, what is the information you can get out of your model. It's, in the end, it's a black box but it's working. Um, and what is also important to tell is that it's um, computationally quite heavy. So the training for this specific case um, took around um, two hours on a single GPU, but for example, compared to um, a single CPU, it took around two days or two and a half days, which is quite long. Okay, so that already brings me to like the wrap up of the whole talk. 
So what I've shown you is um, the different applications of machine learning and research. Um, we saw that um, machine learning is quite helpful and powerful in the detection um, of hidden patterns in data, in research data, like for example the prediction of events of arm movements um, in EEG signals. And um, on top of that, um, it also uh, allows or gives us interpretable <coughs> models, um, which allows us a further insight into, um, into the data. And then um, it also, so more for the deep learning part of it, um, it um, gives us an automatization of time consuming processes, like for example, the generation of segmentation images. And with that, um, first of all, I would like to thank my colleagues uh, from uh, Scientific IT Services at ETH. So this is uh, my group, um, which is focusing mostly on research informatics, but there are also other people doing consultant work, kind of consultant work in high performance computing and software development for ETH researchers. And so last but not least, I would like to thank you for your attention and I will be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Francisca. Any questions? Hello, thank you very much for the brilliant speech. I was interested in your opinion because I've been reading that certain criticism have been aimed towards mach using machine learning in scientific research due to yeah. uh, in issues with reproducibility of Could you say that reproducibility with the models. Ah, mm -hmm. okay. I would like to know your opinion on that. Um, I think it highly depends on, on the use case or the, the specific application. So, for example, if we're coming back to this uh, generation of segmentation images, what you could easily do is to um, yeah, save the model itself, right? So, so save the model structure and also the model base, and then it would be quite easy to produce the same result again. Um, but of course, I can imagine that there are use cases where it's quite hard to, like, yeah, to get this reproducibility um, for, for the research or the application of machine learning and research. But do you have a specific example? Okay. Anybody else? Hi, thank you for your presentation. A short question. Have you used for this deep learning also Keras? It just um, I used Keras, yes, the whole. And does it support GPU learning too? Say it again, GPU, but ah, yeah, it, it supports. So basically what is quite nice about Keras is that, um, so you can run the same code on a machine with CPU or GPU and it directly that chooses the right computational backend, I would say. So um, so if you run it on a GPU machine, it uses a GPU and it, yeah, the training is a lot faster then. Uh, and one more question yeah. about this image, image segmentation. Have yeah. you used color images too or just black and white? Uh, in this case, I just used black and white. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Um, how do you s decide which method to use? Like, for example, in the image se segmentation, why did you choose a ne neural network and why did you choose the U UNet? Um, so for this specific case, I um, used the unit because I was reading up a lot about it and it is, yeah, I would say why the state of the art method to use at the moment for the generation of these specific segmentation images. But in general, I would say um, if there's a simpler algorithm or a simpler model I could use, I always start with a simpler one and then if it's not giving a good result, I go to the next more complicated one. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. For the pre-processing, the mm -hmm. tasks are very domain specific. Yes. So how do you know, how do you find out what you need to do to prepare the data? Um, Given that you are maybe data scientist, you don't have the domain yeah. knowledge. So for this specific use case, basically I was just uh, was reading up in the textbooks um, what is the way to do, or yeah, the, the way to go for um, the processing of this EEG signals. And um, I think, if you're applying machine learning to your own research, mostly you know what to do to your data. Um, if you're someone coming from a different field, um, you have to look into what are the, the state-of-the-art methods to do a processing of the data. So it's not only the machine learning knowledge, it's also you need to acquire the domain yes. knowledge. Yeah, that's highly important. Yeah. 
Okay, so uh, that's the time. Okay. <laughs> so thank you again. Thank you.